Hi, this is Private Air Station, and today we're bringing you another special economic material, uh, an interview by uh, Russian economist Igor Lipsitz, PhD in economy, and in his past he was a professor of uh, high school of economy, until he was forced to leave the country. His host, Lubov Sobol, she is a Russian opposition politician, member of the party Future Russia, that was supported by Alexei Navalny. Up until 2021, she was a lawyer for Navalny's anti-corruption fund, and recently a popular blogger and YouTube host. On the 25th of January 2022, for her activity, she was added to the Registry of Terrorists and Extremists by Putin's government, and starting 2022, she joined the Anti-War Committee. As always, special thanks go to our members. Today, uh, we nod to John Afseth. Thank you for supporting us. And uh, guys, please do not forget to click the like, share and subscribe, or perhaps consider joining our channel if you can. With this, let's dive into the economic overview of Putin's Russia. Enjoy. Hi, Igor. We'll be talking with you for the first time. And for those who do not know you, I should introduce you. Doctor of Economic Sciences, a professor, an ex-professor of Russian uh, Economics uh, Academy and uh, an owner of a rather popular economic uh, YouTube channel. So I want to talk to you about economy. And before we go in there, we probably should first talk about the trends in the Russian economy that we saw in the recent years. So my first question is about the condition of Russian economy, the way it was uh, by March of 2024. Well, it came in a very diverse state. It's difficult to paint it with one brush but it arrived in a condition when there were different components of market economy still functioning with uh, practically new segments having been created over the last 30 years and they were relatively well functioning and they were not all production segments there was first of all a rather well established uh, system of trade wholesale and retail banking system was uh, rather well founded cell phone communications a lot of um, well-working systems in uh, construction. There was basically a relatively working market economy system. It was not too effective because a lot of money was spent on some government or gray schemas. And the average growth of the economy was 1.2%, but still, in the recent years, there was no big... Uh, decline, there was just a stagflation, if you want to call it, or stagnation rather. It was going for the last almost nine years, almost 10 years since 20, uh, 2013. So Russia still had some resources and there were chances to turn it around because super profits from oil and gas industry were still coming into the economy and with the smart management, one could uh, say that Russia could get itself out of the de deep uh, crisis that it is now in. And there were actually some suggestions even recently, I think it was uh, 2012 and also 2008, a program 2020 that was uh, written for back then President Medvedev with a lot of suggestions and ideas for the country. But none of them were implemented, so it all led us to stagnation and the country was slowly getting weaker and crumbling apart. And it indicated that in the future it will have to face these problems. But if the war didn't happen, they would have enough resources to take care of it. But with the war entering the picture, it's good uh, image so far that I don't think it's uh, fixable in the near future. Thank you. What will be happening with a Russian ruble? Do you think people will see its uh, exchange rate going down against dollar and euro and other places? Do you think that uh, it was held artificially for the elective election activities of Putin? Do you think it will go down to 150 or 200 rubles per dollar? Well, first of all, let's understand that the exchange rate of ruble is not a market value anymore. In front of us, the system of currency exchange in Russia was destroyed and it took it a while to be built. It uh, went through pains to be formed and it was working rather fine in the recent decades. But uh, and even at some point, ruble was a relatively good exchange, um, good means of exchange 
you could buy things in Russian rubles in the neighboring countries. So there was some progress in it. Now this is no more. Starting basically with the beginning of this war, currency exchange market in Russia was uh, being systemically decimated and Russia returned back to centrally regulated exchange course that is being determined by a central bank and minister of finance and those players who refuse to play by the rules they can be banished from the market and that happened when in december of 2023 russian congress adopted another bill about organized currency trade as they call it and central bank got a policing function there to expel from the system of currency trade any organization that is doing basically not what central bank wants it to do and it affects the exchange rate or does something contrary to the game of the central bank so any company that is trading on the currency exchange uh, central bank can banish and banish them for up to six months and as a lawyer only boy if you probably understand that it's basically like a house arrest for the company so it outlined the rules for the players and that's why the exchange rate of ruble is not defined by the market economy anymore but rather by bureaucrats so they had a goal to make sure the ruble does not fall below 100 rubles per dollar and that's what they managed to hold till putin's uh, re-election activities but now situation will be changing because the financial situation in the country is rather complex and to achieve the amount of profits that they want to in order to fulfill their budget is difficult if you do not devolve, devaluate uh, ruble. And we don't know how deep the financial pit will grow this year. Even Minister of Finance do not know. These expenses are poorly predictable and uh, Minister of Finance have nothing to do in controlling them in terms of military expenses. So likely the ruble course exchange rate will be vectoring down and uh, it will not be a one-time drop but likely they'll continue to devaluate it as far as i understand they get it, this is a somewhat dangerous situation for russian economy right this is, this history cannot have no consequences oh sure yeah it uh, definitely has a lot of implications and uh, some of them are rather entertaining i'm uh, writing um corresponding with a lot of people both in russia and outside of russia those who have left a curious story is that now we have different exchange rates of ruble, both in uh, Russia and outside of Russia. For example, in Kazakhstan, the exchange rate is very different for ruble because there it is not controlled by Russian central bank. And last time um, they told me it was about 150 rubles per dollar and 160 per euro. So again, um, it becomes rather interesting to get involved in resale in different markets so people can essentially make money on selling ruble around in the neighboring countries in different exchange markets and they have a special term now in uh, central bank in russia offshore ruble market so there is a ruble market that is not controlled by putin's government but it is russian companies and russian citizens who are participating in it that indicates that russia does not quite control all operations with its currency and now there is a shadow component or black market segment of uh, currency exchange and if they will continue tightening it, there'll be that market will definitely strengthen. There'll be more players on it that will allow you to exchange your rubles to dollars and euros and other currencies at uh, more realistic exchange rates, uh, avoiding the limitations of Russian government. So it will be in parallel to the real one, right? Exactly. So we did want also want to talk to you about business. Um, what are the rough basic trends for business looking into 2024 and what should entrepreneurs that still try to survive in russia and that economy uh, be looking out for and what we're noticing that if earlier putin's government was mostly concentrated on large corporations now they're looking at it seems that they're actually trying to gather money from everybody there are a, a lot of bloggers commenting on uh, russian irs going after them and if government was basically not noticing middle and small level businesses, now it appears that they are really doing a lot of audits and pulling money from everywhere they can. Oh yes, uh, please understand, they have a simple situation above, they do not have enough money. And when you do not have enough money, you start looking for any source available, that is what's happening with Ministry of Finance. I think yesterday they had another 
meeting at uh, Russian IRS and the Vice Minister of Finance was uh, making a speech and screaming about tightening the bolts and not letting anybody ignore the taxation system and not pay what they have to. They will be tightening all the bolts in different segments of economy. They know different ways that physical and corporate entities are avoiding being taxed. And uh, he was very emotional about not letting anybody optimize, uh, even in the legal fashion, their, fa their taxes. So the problem is that the military expenses are growing. And another side of it is that government, Putin's government cannot fully abandon social expenses. They would love to, they would want to, but they can't, because otherwise they're risking a revolt among the masses and you still need to repair some of the utilities. And on one hand, you have to try to expand your military production, but then there are there is a civil society that you still need to take care of, right? Even if you don't want to. But the country is crumbling. It is a very, very war worn out country. Look at the events this uh, winter, when a lot of communication pipes, water pipes were blowing, bursting, and people were freezing in their houses. And it will not be better in the future. It will only get worse because they don't have any programs. Putin promised in his speech 4.5 trillion rubles for utility systems over the next six years. That's only 800 billion rubles a year. And that is not enough. That's puny and pathetic because you need to spend several trillions per year on these systems in order to even maintain them. And all these small amounts will not change the trend. So there'll be more trouble growing. Of course, uh, utilities, water, electric. There is a, lar a lot of screams going about elevators in Russia. Imagine living in a high rise that doesn't work, uh, that doesn't have a working elevator, especially if you're elderly or disabled. So the problem is there. Uh, they do not have money to rectify it. All the money are going to support their war efforts. And now we have a situation when economic system starts to resonate, where they have different sources of disturbance and they start to resonate between each other. It's a rather scary picture for economists to observe. It's curious uh, as hell to uh, um, look into this and see it's unfolding, but it may be really dangerous for people who are living through that. Right, when I saw this winter, people warming up by the fires in the backyards because the heating systems in their house were out, um, it's scary to realize that you are right predicting that, but um, yeah, here we are. And there are no money to fix because all of these systems in Russia are centralized, so it's a lot of expenses. It's not like a private user can do it on his own. So what the options are, the people understand that next winter things will become worse and they'll be growing like a large snowball. And people cannot even protest because, right, they will be accused of being foreign agents. But it's hilarious when they'll be pointing finger at home at Biden that he broke their pipes and utilities. Now, the government indeed cannot solve anything in this case. In order to solve these problems, they would need to have rather big, large programs to address it. It is difficult, first of all, because uh, it re requires money. Second, because our utility systems in Russia is uh, very filled with uh, bribery and corruption. So you need way more money that you would otherwise need in a more effective system. And one of the main problems that people are quite aware of that, for example, in Moscow suburbs, they were building multi-story buildings and they were connecting them to the same utilities as before without upgrading the utility channels. And people were writing to government for years that you should not be doing that, that the system will not hold, that it'll start breaking apart. When old hot water pipes that are used in Russia for heating the houses in winter were used to be connected uh, to by the new developments without expanding their capacity. So at the end, the system is overloaded. They need to replace, dig it out, replace them. Huge problems. Russia came to the beginning of 21st century, a very worn out country. It was urbanized in the 20th century and they spent a lot of money and effort doing so. But this was all old. By the 21st century, Khrushchev uh, apartment buildings of the 60s are old. Even Brezhnev's uh, times apartment buildings, they were already 
25 to 30 year old by the beginning of this century, and now they're closing 50. In Russia, there are still older constructions that were used to bring people from villages to work in the factories back in 1930s. So the country is huge and very worn out. It should have been repaired systemically and it could have profited rather well if that program was adopted, but that didn't happen. And that's why they entered the first decade of 21st century, very worn out with a lot of industrial issues, with a lot of utilities issues. And you can easily check me, you can just check the stats of, for example, the service uh, terms in years for Russian energy segment. You'll see a lot of scary data, how worn out are electric stations, how worn out are even the dams that are helping to generate the water energy. But they had to move all that aside. They started spending money on war, and now they don't have money to fix or address that and repair anything. And the worst part for them is that regardless of the outcome of this war, they will not find money to fix it, because if they prevail in this conflict in Ukraine, they will have a huge territory destroyed and devastated by the war action that need, will need some money to rebuild and sustain, right? If Russia loses all that, and then they will have to be paying retributions to Ukraine. So there is not an option in Russian future where they would be free in their spending, where they can make money and try to use a good chunk of it for fixing its own issues. So there is not a good scenario. And Russian business will be a cash cow, which is already being milked heavily. And funny enough, they often suggest a soap for the rope that they're being hang upon. For example, right now they're trying to increase the tax on uh, profits from 20 to 25 percent. How did this idea come about? Last year, uh, Putin's uh, Ministry of Finance invented another tax for super profits, from which uh, large-scale corporations howled, and then they decided to come to agreement with Putin's government. Strange people, right? But they decided to. So they said, uh, let's increase uh, the profit tax maybe be for half a percent, but just don't do those super taxes on super profits. President said, oh, fantastic, so you want to increase that, let's do it. And they increased the profit tax, but not only for half percent, but for five percent. And that's how big businesses in Russia are suggesting to kill themselves, and now they have to pay more for out of their profits, so they don't have any money left uh, at the end of it. Then the credit is high because the economy is not open. And my question, open question to them is, how are you going to evolve? How are you going to grow? Indeed, Igor, there was an interesting story recently about uh, one of the Russian businessmen from the list of Forbes was uh, had three of his big businesses taken away. So it seems like they're starting to change the ownership of many of these companies and corporations in Russia. And I saw some of your predictions. Is it the near future? You've been predicting some of these processes. And they do seem very realistic. Well, they're not, I'm not inventing them, right? I'm not inventing my prognostications. I'm just analyzing trends and writing summaries and extrapolating of what's uh, happening into the future. And the processes I'm describing very often are inertiary and they last for years. So we saw preparations for this war for quite a while. It's just finally we can see it because it surfaced and you can see that the conflict is in a hot uh, stage. And now we can see how people who had, for example, $700 million, not the richest, but one of the Forbes list, and he had three factories that were taken away from him recently. And that's what brought him on the radar of many people. And until that moment, many people didn't chose not to notice these trends. Yeah, I call this a stage of war. This is how I define it in my lectures on my YouTube channel. Um, this war will be a civilian war in Russia, some elements of it will be peaceful, some elements of it will be hot, with arms and weapons. Um, but again, listen to President of Russia. In his message, he basically outlined this uh, future. And in his message to his Federal Congress, he said that we will have new elites now, those who earned this title fighting for the motherland. And those who became rich in the 90s, they are not the elites. And who are those elites of the 90s? These are all the oligarchs and billionaires who got the property in Yeltsin times from Yeltsin government. Right, Deripaska, Patanin, and the like. Exactly. 
because they all got those properties because they said they are fully supporting Yeltsin and Chubais got uh, funding systems established for their government and they were given assets those uh, famous auctions that happened at the end of USSR that is, are still driving some economists crazy how it was done but uh, in essence uh, Putin is saying that now they have to share they have to relinquish their ownership of some of these assets so sorry for interrupting you here but it uh, seems like it'll be additional feeding of uh, power elites for Putin right yes this is the birth of uh, power nobility not Yeltsin's, but Putin's, of his own. Yeltsin created his own guard of his own uh, people, but they serve their purpose. Putin doesn't need them. Uh, those select few that support him ardently, they will remain in force, but the rest will be gone. And we're going back to the end of USSR. Remember, there was no people's revolution. There was a revolution of the party secretaries who wanted to exchange their position of power for some money, and that's what exactly happened. And now we're in a similar picture, but now instead of the party lines, we will have those uh, representatives of power systems like uh, FSB, IRS, Army, Internal Affairs, Police. Uh, all of them want to own some property and they want to own some business. And that means that there'll be a lot of businesses changing ownership. On the higher level, it will be done in a rather peaceful fashion when prosecutor's office will be changing ownership. But in a lower level, you can find that a lot of businesses are set up under the governors of regions and the governors would not necessarily be so willing to give up their properties to other people to uh, replace uh, their inner circles. So, and as you know, some of them are already creating their private mercenary corps, so they will have enough people to fight for them and they already have enough weapons in countries. So now it's like 1917 again when people have enough weapons and interests to fight over. So there probably will not be a revolution, but a situation where a criminal will be fighting a hot warfare regionally, that's quite possible. What about the stabilization funds? Do they have any reserves? We see that it's currently dwindling. Are there any other reserves where Putin can go and patch the holes in the budget? Well, Lyubov, I think reserves are running out this year. All Russian economists, are in agreement, they're in unison, predicting that there'll be probably enough money to cover this year. They have uh, also one additional emergency fund, which is less than a trillion. They have some dwindling accounts in uh, Treasury, but they're diminishing. And now we're seeing an attempt to set up a financing, basically from wheels, right? So they're trying to find ways to bring more money urgently. They're devaluating their currency, they're printing more, they're trying to de-stimulate exports. Basically, Russia that is living and breathing due to exports needs so much money, so much cash, that they actually started stifling their own exports, except for oil and gas. And this is a horrible story for any economist, but they it just shows that they needed to have money. And this is a wild story, but they just needed to take money from somewhere, and they are. They're expropriating money in this extraordinary fashion to use for military production. So we're expecting the higher income tax. We see the high profit tax coming this year. We also are hearing about the value-added tax coming soon, and that is to be expected, in my estimation. But this is a dual-edged sword, in my opinion, because if you keep increasing taxes, people will go in the shadows, and then they finally completely resign from paying any official taxes, and it'll become easier for them to find ways around it than paying money into budget. Of course. But the government hopes now, Mishustin created a rather detailed system of control that is so piercing through different economic sectors that they hope that they'll be able to break taxpayers and catch them at every step and not let them go into the shadows. So they hope that Russians will not be able to go hiding. How successful they will be, I don't know, it's hard to tell, but uh, we can tell that Russian businesses are seeing uh, these bad trends and there is a huge outflow of capital from Russia and they are failing to stop it. Last year it was a very 
uncomfortable issue for a central bank in Russia when all of a sudden they discovered that uh, nine billion dollars left the country and they couldn't even trace how. Usual monetary outflow was about a billion a year, this time it was nine and central bank failed to even trace how it happened. And now they're attacking traders on the crypto market, cryptocurrencies, and uh, one can see that uh, they're tightening the bolts there. And I suspect uh, those banks that were actively participating on that market are being shut down as well. That Kiva bank that recently was closed was also a player there. So government is trying to find different ways and shut them down. But as you know, water can always find a way. And that's what I'm thinking about Russian business. Igor, we're always being told how Western partners are being successfully replaced by the Eastern. Recently, in the interview to a commerçant, uh, Vitaly Chukshuglin uh, said uh, he's the lead, the head of the investment segment of uh, foreign trade bank of Russia. Do you think uh, the West can be replaced by the East? Is it real? Luba, every bureaucrat is saying what he needs to say. And he needs to say anything that would uh, make him good, look good in the eyes of their superiors. But sometimes even they make mistakes, making statements. And the beautif beautiful part of it is that every bureaucrat has his own interests and they are defending their own I interests. So you can compare the statement from that uh, banking official to the statement by Sabyanin in the other vertical of power uh, in the Moscow region. and. Sabanian is saying that we thought Chinese will help us, but they dumped us on a lot of technological aspects. They're not giving us certain technologies or selling them to us, and they're charging us uh, threefold. We thought they're friends, and they're anything but friends. So if you read that, and it goes in complete contradiction to this banking fella. So it's interesting to observe from different uh, vantage points, and it's a silly estimation that China will replace the West. China doesn't look to support Russian economy. They look to sell their goods there, and they don't need to uh, support and prop Russian economy. They just want to have a new market. There is no reason for them to build their production facilities on Russian territory. China doesn't see Russian economy building or producing goods for self-consumption. China wants to sell their own goods. At some point, they had some plans for development, but they faded away rather rapidly, and nothing happened. They even tried a couple times. And one can remember an um, example from Belarus. There was a beautiful project that Belarus will become a perch for China expansion into Europe. So China had the idea that they'll be building companies and uh, production capabilities in Belarus and will be selling goods to Europe from there, which is much cheaper and faster than selling it by sea. They even had some ideas about building some silicon type, uh, Silicon Valley type enterprise. Lukashenko even gave some money for that, but nothing came out of it. Different culture, different conditions. China's business uh, failed to be ported into the ex USSR, Russian or Belarus environment. China is also afraid to get sanctioned. They are concerned about that. The American market is more important and interesting for them. And secondary sanctions we see being implemented. So they're giving something, uh, they're giving, selling some goods and doing some activities, but they're not providing brotherly shoulder for Russia to stand upon, so to say. We still see that uh, Chinese consumer goods are being actively sold in Russia. Remember back in the 90s, uh, there were flea markets of low quality goods everywhere. And now we have Wildberries, that uh, network that sells a lot of uh, Chinese uh, products. And we also see small Russian companies that are buying different products in China. Quality often uh, lacks, but uh, still, there's a lot of that activity happening. And we can see that China is using Russia as uh, a market where you can dump low-quality, cheap goods. Well, Lubov. I think it was at the end of 22 when uh, Central Bank of Russia made a statement that defined how they see the future. It's not me, uh, some damn pessimist, but Central Bank of Russia made a statement that the beautiful future of Russia is development of commerce, individual commerce on both industrial and uh, production markets, manufacturing markets, 
And it appears that it goes back to the 90s, right? Oh yeah, those people who lived through the 1990s, they start to recognize these things and they're repeating over again. It doesn't mean that it will repeat 100%, but a lot of processes from the 90s will be occurring again, including changing ownership of different companies. But back then that change ownership was orchestrated by Chubais and Yeltsin's government, and now it's uh, Putin's prosecutor's office who will be leading it. And beyond that, it'll be some shooting, some blood, and some deaths for new ownership. We have a lot of rather bad trends already revealing themselves, including mysterious deaths of managers of the oil companies. That is also related to that business getting more and more criminalized, and there are a lot of grey flows of money. And wherever grey money appear, there are always a temptation to redirect that flow to somebody's pocket, and then it usually results in sudden death of young people. And that's another sign of the 1990s, when we had a lot of people dying in shootouts, different conflicts over control of the sharehold shares and ownership control of different companies. And that's where we are heading, full steam. By the way, those mysterious deaths noted by journalists, five top managers of Luke Oil Corporation died under mysterious circumstances in the last year and a half. That also raises a lot of questions, right? Of course, Luke Oil is a big export company ex that is exporting oil with a lot of money flows there. And people usually like the money flow to not be too far away from them. So they're trying to capture these uh, monetary flows. And the way you do it by removing the stubborn managers who do not want to work with you and then install the ones who do want to work with you. And we've known these stories back in the 90s uh, plenty. Um, People were losing their businesses easily. All of a sudden, the owner would have been locked out of the company because the whole company was either owing money to the right people or suddenly some people bankrupted it and bought it out for a dime. And that's uh, likely what's going to happen. There'll be three criterias to take away the property and general prosecutor's office is using it to actively to take away different production capabilities and not only production, but um, they're also taking away resorts from their rightful owners. We already hear screams on the fund exchange of Russia that minority shareholders should not be having their shares taken away because they purchased them on the stock exchange. And the uh, prosecutor's office actually takes the shares not only from majority shareholders, but also from minorities as well. So you purchased shares and now all of a sudden you lose them. Because prosecutor's office, uh, Putin's DA, said, no, this uh, deal doesn't work. The company was privatized in a wrong fashion back 30 years ago. So these shares are illegal. Um, and one more question, not to hold you for too long, but I see the question very often in our commentary. Will Russia go back to planned economy? As we understand, uh, the processes are somewhat going in that direction, specifically in regards to military production. But to what degree can that happen, can be scaled? overall to the economic situation in Russia, to the Soviet times. We understand that 90s are revealing themselves here and there, but what about the Soviet methods? Well, Lyubov, let's try to explain. In order to have a planned economy, you first need to conduct a total nationalization. Planned economy and private enterprise, they're incompatible, because if you're a private enterprise, you're working in your own interests and you're deciding what are you making and whom are you selling to. But if you have a planned economy, then you're just following the plan that is given to you by the government, then you're not a private owner. So that's why in order to have planned economy, one would need to do full nationalization of economy and implement criminal repercussions for deviating from the government plan. So in order to create planned economy, you first need to destroy private property in the sphere of business. Then you need to educate people who can write these plans, who do not steal and do not cannot be bribed. Well, that's almost unrealistic, right? Exactly, you're getting my drift here. I am coming from the planning environment. I'm the son of the federal planner. I know how this system works. I know how these people worked. They had a different mentality. They did not take bribes. They're different people. And we don't have people like that anymore. It's a different culture now. So neither from legal nor from human resource, you cannot build a planned economy in Russia now, because any plan will be immediately bribed through. If you're a private company, 
forced to face some planned production, you'll likely be bringing money to a certain bureaucrat or giving a cold crypto wallet to the bureaucrat that is impossible to trace where the money came from. So it's all a diff rather difficult story. That's why I'm very skeptical about planned economy under Putin. We will have a planless economy, authoritarian planless economy. Um, it'll please explain. It'll be self-destructing mode. There'll be a lot of disconnects, a lot of disproportions and conflicts and deficits, and it will be a mad picture that will crumble the economy even worse than any war could. I don't want to finish our interview on such a pessimistic note, but I still wanted to thank you for answering these uh, hard questions, and I would love if our viewers continue sending us questions in the commentary. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, subscribe to Igor Lipset's uh, channel, and of course to the Privateer Station if you are listening or watching that in English. Till later.